Okay guys, so today we're going to get into the Enlightenment and we have a few videos that we're going to be watching on this and, and really this video is just to kind of give you an idea of what the Enlightenment is all about and as I have here, the pen just might be mightier than the sword here. So what is the Enlightenment exactly? I have a couple quotes here, I think, from Immanuel Kant that actually best describes it here. Uh, Immanuel Kant's a philosopher, I'll be talking about him later. Um, and he has this idea, and he has this quote, that man leaving his self-caused immaturity, um, and that basically the idea of the Enlightenment is that prior to this time, man had been previously unable to do that, meaning that we were not using our brains enough, we were not thinking deeply enough, we were not challenging ourselves, and we were not looking deep enough at things like government and how people act and why they do it, and what you're going to see with the Enlightenment, this is a period of these philosophers that are going to have lots of different ideas on government and man and stuff like that, but they're, they're going to have a level of influence which is going to come that I don't know if you can argue that was really there before. I mean, there have been all sorts of philosophers all over the world. We could go ancient Greece and stuff like that. But the philosophers that come at this time really do have a, a tremendous amount of influence um, in the world. And a lot of these guys today wouldn't necessarily be called philosophers. They'd be called academics. But they're still really, really important, okay? And I love his other quote here, you know, dare to know, have the courage to use your own intelligence. And again, what we talked about, we've got publishing, we've got all these ways, and, and that's really kind of what the Enlightenment is all about. Now, what allowed the Enlightenment to occur? Well, undoubtedly, a big thing that influenced it was the scientific revolution. This idea of that education is popular and scientists have become well known and, and like being smart is kind of a cool and hip thing and people want more, okay? A guy that really helps with this, though, is a man by uh, Bernard de Fontenelle. I probably said it wrong, but that's okay. Um, he was the secretary of the French Royal Academy of the Sciences. Uh, he lived from 1691 to 1451, or 1741, whoops. Um, and what he got, okay, and I have his ideas here, is he really understood the technical aspects of a lot of the scientific revolution. So when he's reading these writings, he got it. But what he also understood, and what his goal here was, was that he wanted to make these ideas more understandable for regular people. He wanted regular folks to understand the significance of what was going on in the scientific revolution. So he wrote, he, he wrote this um, book called The Plurality of Worlds, and the idea is this was a dialogue between a woman aristocrat and her lover while hiding under the stairs. And I know it sounds kind of crazy, but he used this kind of, I guess, analogy to explain like cosmology and how the universe was working and it doesn't sound like it should work but in the 1700s this was something that people kind of understood and, and really got and there are lots of, uh, of of authors that have done this today and this has been really influential i have an example here uh the elegant universe which is by my man up here brian green um which was a really great book that that took a really complicated thing like string theory and stuff like that and put it into words that you know, I understand, and, and he's a big Simpsons fan, and, and he uses some of the Simpsons characters to make you understand some really, really complex stuff, and, and, and Pierre, and I'm sorry, and Bernard's work was like really, really popular, and people understood it, and this really encouraged a lot of philosophers to, to write. Another thing that was actually good, but some would be bad, was this idea of travel literature, or basically, guys, just nonfiction, okay? All of these people that would travel around the world would write a lot of books, and, and their their journeys would find their way into print. And probably the most influential, and we've talked about them before, was James Cook's Travels. Um, and he was writing about all these societies, and and people really, you know, found this fascinating because the societies that Cook came into contact with in the Pacific were really different. And again, it's this idea of of nonfiction type writing. It doesn't have to be a novel or a play. And and this is important because you know 
people are going to write because someone else wants to read it. Now, there are some bad things that come out here. Um, if you look on the right, this idea of uh, polygenism or polygenism, I think it's polygenism. Um, and you see here, these are the four races of man. Unfortunately, this is going to lead to a lot of the Europeans and the quote-unquote white race, if you will, is superior to the rest of the world because no one has anything that we have and and sadly this is going to lead to some science-y type things that are not so good um, and that is going to be a big negative thing and we're going to get into that more and just over here you see how you know the European guy's all in his tie and jacket and these guys aren't and, and this is something that we're going to get deep into a little bit later but nonetheless you know it was it, it was going on now, um, what we're also going to get are some early guys here. You know, the, the Enlightenment really hits, I think, quite large in the 18th century, the 1700s. But you have some earlier guys in the 1600s that are going to be really, really important. And one of these guys is Pierre Bell. Um, Pierre Bell lived from 1647 to 1706. Um, he was a Protestant. Um, and, and religion is what kind of got him into stuff, okay? What he lived in France during Louis XIV, and, and what he didn't like is he saw a lot of people being forced to worship certain religions and, and the banning of Protestantism, and he felt that it was really, really, um, that it was hypocritical. And the he was one of your first writers in Europe to really write a lot about religious toleration and how that actually benefits the state because if you have religious toleration you're not going to have a lot of these wars of course that were being fought but his biggest biggest thing is this idea of skepticism and the idea of skepticism is and you have this this quote over here on the right um, it is pure illusion to think that an opinion that passes down from century to century from generation to generation may not be entirely false so <clears throat> excuse me, we talked about this a little bit under, with the scientific revolution, but skepticism has an important role because it looks at the functions of society and it looks at the world and it looks at reality and all these other things and, and it, it casts doubt on them. And, and he was kind of that guy that would like, people would have, would reason something out and he would bring up like paradoxes. And, and the idea of bail was, was that you can't just take everything for granted. You can't just assume that everything is the way that it is. And, and sometimes bail might have taken this to a little bit of a, you know, a little bit of a high degree, but Nonetheless, this is going to pose uh, or, or prove to be a pretty influential philosophy. You know, and, and the idea of skeptics, though, I think that you see at this time is a little bit different. It's not like everything's always false, it's always false, it's always false. I think this meme here doesn't believe in the force, but changes its position when shown empirical evidence. Han Solo doing skepticism right since 1977. On a side note, Han Solo, best movie character in the history of mankind. But this idea that we, skept we, we, we are skeptical of things, we gather data and we gather our own observations, and if things change, things change, and that's okay. Probably the guy that's the huge deal here is John Locke, um, a man from England who, fun fact, had asthma. But John Locke was a writer, and he wrote two big works, the two treatises on government and an essay concerning human understanding that would prove to be very, very influential. In the two treatises of government, he basically puts out the idea that the purpose of the government is to create order, okay? And that the role of the government, so in other words, how does the government promote order? That it allows people to have these three ideas, life, liberty, and property. Remember those. Yes, pursuit of happiness is important in the Declaration of Independence, so maybe mild borrowing, if you will, ideas of, of from Locke by Jefferson, but this idea that people are basically reasonable and will work together provided that those three things, life, liberty, and property, are insured by the governments. 
And an interesting idea is that rulers should only stay in power if they have the consent of those that they governed. Now, what's important about this idea of rulers is that if rulers break this contract, then people do have the right to rebel. Now, he doesn't advocate a republicanism or monarchy. He, he doesn't really care what the government is. He's like, as long as the government can do those three core things, you know, ensure the three things, and keep order, that it should have a relatively limited impact on, on people, that you leave people alone regular day-to-day, -day, it should work out, okay? And if you don't do those things, then, then people are going to have a problem. And this is going to be really important because John Locke's ideas are going to be used and, and interpreted in a variety of different ways. We're going to see some new government changes as we move forward. The United States is going to be really influential here. Um, the United States Founding Fathers, very influential, but influenced by a guy like John Locke. And so this is a guy that we're going to be getting back to. His other idea is called the Essay Concerning Human Understanding. And psychologists love this guy because he uses this concept called the tabula rasa. You have it right here or right over there. The idea of a quote-unquote blank slate that everything a human knows comes from sensory experience and the environment, that there is nothing inherent. Like, there's biological things that are inherent, but the way we think and feel and believe, it is all based on the world. And that's why for him, education is really, really crucial for humans, and that you can be changed by exposure to new environments and different education, but at the core of all of this is that all men are created equal. And this is going to be an interesting thing that we're going to develop because we know a lot of humans do not think that way and that there's going to be things that they act and then others do that think that way and there's going to be certain things and ways that they act. And so this is going to be an important concept that we need to follow. But this guy is a titan and we're going to be getting back to him quite a bit. And then what you basically end up having here was the philosophies. Guys like... Um, Fontenelle and uh, John Locke and Pierre Bale are going to in basically influence a generation of people. Uh, these are the intellectuals who will lead the invite enlightenment. It is all going to be about reason and rationality. They're going to use that to even look at things like religion. Um, their backgrounds, they tend to be professors, journalists, statesmen, economists, political scientists, and social reformers. That's kind of the general area where they're at. And a lot of times they would like meet, if you see here, kind of this informal setting. They were, um, or they would meet in, you know, the equivalents of like bars and taverns or sometimes people's homes and they would just get together and debate and talk and, and the, the, highest amongst them would end up being the ones that write. Most of the time they were from the nobility and the middle class because they were the ones that actually had the time to do this or they were the ones that had access to education. And probably the big area for this would be um, Paris, okay, which is interesting because this was an area of a lot of uh, resistance to the aristocracy. This was an area, however, France that had an absolute monarchy. So it's like, you know, France was kind of the emblem of control and not being able to think on your own and stuff like that from the government standpoint, yet the people that are living there are coming with these ideas to resist, and it's pretty brilliant. And it really will be an international movement. Now, the role of these guys, what are they all about? Um, uh, I, I basically have a quote for you. A philosopher is one who applies himself to the study of society with the purpose of making his kind better and happier. That is the whole idea. And in the end, the big push that they go for is freedom of expression and that they want that all people should have that right to express themselves and truly a society in which, hey, we don't have to agree with each other, but everybody has that right to freely express themselves and to share their thoughts with others. Now, a lot of these guys, as a result, unfortunately, will get themselves thrown in jail or they'll deal with censors and they have to publish underground, and which is really kind of a cool thing. Um, and a lot of times their books get published using pseudonyms because if they were to use their real names, again, they could get sent in jail. Um, but what's really cool also about them is that they were willing to disagree with the, with one another, just like we said with the, the guys in the scientific revolution. And you have this just cauldron, if you will, of great um, 
of great amounts of people sharing and challenging each other. And we're going to get just some fantastic ideas that build upon the, the ideas of Bale and Locke and that also use the concept of Fontenelle, the idea of like let's, um, let's make this in ways that people can actually uh, agree with one another, or not agree, but that they can um, understand it and it's really going to be a wonderful time. All right, guys, so make sure you do your assignments and we're going to get into it and learn about a lot of philosophers.